Okay, hello and welcome everybody. My name is Jason Allen Jankowski. Thanks for having me today. Dave has been very kind to give me a little bit of broadcast time to share with you um, my unique point of view on markets trading and hopefully provide you a little bit of a real guidance on how to improve your rates of return. A um, couple of things I just want to ask if we could take a minute on. Um, let me, uh, let's do that real quick. Oh, that's not it. Oh, where is my, uh, no, I can't, I very rarely use Zoom, so I am not sure what we're looking at here. I wanted to make sure that uh, I could look at the chat window um, and I can't, no, I don't have it now. I don't know where it is, so. Oh, if you if you move your cursor to around until you see the Zoom menu, it's probably under there? the, uh, it's probably at the top of the screen. You yeah. have multiple monitors. It might be on one of the other monitors. Well, see, that's the thing. Is that uh, right down here? I hate to be doing this, guys, because I'd rather I'd rather be sharing with you what I want to uh, share with you. But now I'm lost. Uh, I want to make sure I could see the question and answer area. Maybe you could help me with that, David. I hate to ask you to do that, but where where uh, is the chat window so I can see what kind of yeah? Question so do you see the Zoom menu? I think this is it up here, but it. it um, yeah. Do you do you see the more button? All right. There's webinar chat. I'll move this over here. Then it is. Yeah, it's yeah, it's the chat. I don't have the, the actual right, Q and A thing enabled. That's just, just the chat. The chat is fine. I just want to yeah. make sure that everybody knows that they can put in something in the chat window. I'm going to watch it, David. If I miss something, I'd love it if you could hop in and just let me know. Okay. Um, but in any case, um, I'm, I'm I just ready posted to start. something in there. Do you do you see that? Yeah, it says test. Okay. Yeah. Now. okay. Yeah. You can cool. See. So that's it. We're all good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I want to just uh, mention one thing to all the listeners. Uh, if you've got direct comments or questions, something you'd like to know more about when you hear me speak, just drop it in the chat window. I'm watching that out of the corner of my eye, but I want to take a minute and um, ask a couple of preliminary questions because I don't know the quality of the audience at this point. Um, I do a lot of broadcasts, a lot of uh, uh, presentations to traders of all different kinds of skill levels and background and knowledge. And it's always helpful for me to kind of know where a good starting point is for the group, because what I'm going to share with you is going to really challenge a lot of what you may feel is uh, true. In other words, it, oh, I'm going to share things with you that's going to put you in a position where you might start asking some really serious questions about why it is you can't make money the way you think you could or you should. And I think uh, a lot of that is uh, due to the psychology that we bring to the table, but more importantly, it's your understanding of how these markets are actually structured. So I wanna just ask one question here. Uh, is there anybody listening that doesn't know what the term zero sum transaction means? Is anybody out there listening that maybe has been trading for a period of time, but has never heard the term? zero sum transaction or doesn't really know what it means or perhaps um, has heard it but you know it doesn't have anything to do with what you do all day long maybe anybody uh, would like to just chat in there for a minute and just tell me i'm always um uh, well not not surprised uh, it happens probably every single time i do a presentation there's at least one or two people who don't know what the term zero sum transaction is. Okay, we have one in here right now so far. 21506 says don't know. Great. Let me ask you specifically, sir or madam, 21506. How long have you been trading in the marketplace? Pat B says no, doesn't know what that is. How long have you been trading, Pat? Uh, this is very important. And what markets maybe you might be trading? 21506 or Pat B. What markets do you trade? And what, uh, how long, uh, 21506, six years, options, okay. And Pat, could I ask you what you've been trading? And uh, when we talk about options, what options? Are we talking about options on stock indices? Are we talking about options on futures? Are we talking about equity options? Uh, are we talking about uh, credit default spreads? I mean, how big of a trader are you? Pat B's been trading for five years. What have you been trading, Pat? I, I, I uh, promise this will be worth your time. Equities and credit spreads, okay. And anybody else want to add anything in there or not? 
Okay. Now, one thing I just want to mention to you, in fairness to you, equities are not considered zero-sum markets, although credit default swaps or credit spreads would be considered zero-sum markets. Pat B says stocks. Okay, so do we have anybody in here that's trading futures, Forex, or options on future futures or Forex? Anybody care to just step up and tell me they're trading those things? Because stocks are not considered zero-sum markets, although equity indices are considered uh, zero-sum markets. Uh, anything that's a futures contract or cash forex market would be considered that. And uh, the reason I ask that is because one of the things that is more difficult for people to really get their mind around, um, Dan says he's been trading options on stocks and options on futures. Okay, but Dan, do you know, have you heard the term zero-sum transaction? Because that would be important for me to know because what I'm going to tell you right now really is going to make a difference to you. Um, Dan says yes. Okay, good. The important thing for you to consider as a, uh, a trader in futures, Forex, or options is that those markets are zero sum markets. And what that means is in order for you to buy the market, someone has to be willing to sell the market. That means that for every buyer, there's a seller. And that sounds pretty simple, right? Uh, but what is not really well known or well understood and requires a lot of thinking to get your head around is the fact that when you put a trade on, if you're buying the market and somebody else is selling it to you, you have to ask yourself the question, how do two people reasonably intelligent people, let's assume, um, can look at the same information, come to an intelligent conclusion as best they're able to, that it's time to buy the market, and somebody else can look at the exact same information and say it's time to sell the market. In other words, both people expect to make money right now. They've decided that the perfect time to do that is right now, and they both enter their orders, and they're exactly opposite each other. One is a buy order, and the other is a sell order. So if I buy the market, I'm expecting to win because the market price is anticipated to move higher. If you sell the market, you're expecting to win based on the anticipation of the price moving lower. Well, it can't do both. And so at some point later on, let's say the market has rallied, you're now holding a loss and I'm holding an open trade profit. Uh, at some point, when we both liquidate those trades, my profit comes from your loss. In other words, if you lose in the market, that money is transferred to my account. So you don't make money in the market by anticipating a price change. You don't make money in the market by guessing which way the price is going to go. You don't make money in the market by studying indicators or oscillators or following certain kinds of analysis methods. You don't make money in the market by knowing the fundamentals or what the news is or anticipating a price change. You make money in the market because the loser has to get out. And when the loser gets out, he pays you. So you make money when somebody else loses. Now, equities are slightly different because it's more game of musical chairs in a case like that because of a company authorizes uh, 400 million shares and all 400 million are sold. They're out there somewhere. If the price starts to move higher, it, there's no trading done. They mark it higher, but it's not actually traded until somebody says, I'll sell mine. So they liquidate. That means they're out now. So they're gone and somebody else has picked up those shares and they now own those shares. In a highly liquid market for equities, such as Walt Disney or something like that, then you're going to find that there really isn't any problem entering or offsetting even up to maybe 100,000 shares at a time. But in most marketplaces that aren't that liquid, most of the times playing in stocks or equities is a game of musical chairs. Whoever is left holding the stock at the last bell is the person who's at risk. The person who buys it can sell it anytime, and the person who sells it already owns it. So in most cases, Trading in equities is like a game of musical chairs, whereas trading in futures, forex, or options is a is a game like a tug of war. Whoever's got more push on one side wins. So in most cases, in order for you to make money in the markets, you have to know where the loser is and you got to take the other side of his transaction. If you don't know how to do that, 
then you're gambling and you don't really know how to trade, even though you think you do. And that's part of what the problem is. And this is what I teach in my education and training. And this is what I've come to learn from my 40 plus years of trading experience is that if you want to win, you have to know who you're trading against, who your opposition is, who your opponent is. And you have to know when that guy is just too dumb to figure it out and take the other side of his trade. That's where the money is. Now, understanding that puts you at a beginning place that's different than everybody else trading. Everybody out there believes that they can chart and analyze and draw lines and curly cues and ratios and you know all this kind of stuff on a piece of paper. And they'll end up figuring out and projecting which way the market's going to go. And as you already know, if you've been trading for any length of time, some of you guys have been trading a few years, six or eight years, you know that that doesn't even it doesn't even come close to helping you in most cases the reason you're not making money is because a you scared yourself out when you were in a winner and you got out too soon b you were afraid to get in at the right time so you did nothing and the market went right the way you thought it would there's any number of things that have happened you put your order in the market comes down hits your stop price tags you out you're holding you've just paid for your loss and then it goes your way huge and you're not in. We've all had those experiences. And that has nothing to do with analyzing the market. If you could predict price action, I teach this in, in my coursework, and I, I also talk about this in my latest book, The Psychology of Trading, which I'm going to give you a link here in a minute. In fact, I'm going to do that now so that everybody has it, just in case I forget to do it later. There it is. That's the link where you can get it on Amazon. Just have a look. It's best 10 bucks you'll ever spend. And that psychology of trading, one of the things I talk about in there, uh, and, and I mean this with, with absolute sincerity, is that if you could chart your way to market success, people have already done it. Most people, 85% of people on average are losing in this business, even trading equities, they're losing. If your account isn't growing at 45, 55 70 percent a year or more if you're not seeing those kind of gains then you're 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 gambling you're not trading there's something wrong with your approach and you may already know that that there's something wrong with your approach because if you really could chart your way to success people would have already done it and the most successful people in this field would be people who are chartists and analysts and they're not and you're not and you know that now, I'm not saying that to be negative, and I'm not saying that to hurt your feelings. I'm saying you really do deserve better. And if you want to do better, one of the things that you have to do is adapt your approach to the underlying facts of how the markets perform. And most people don't know what those facts are. So I'm going to take a few minutes and kind of help you through the beginning stages of understanding what those facts are. And then the floor is going to be open to Q&A anytime you want. Um, we can start right now. You feel free to put a comment or question into um, the webinar chat, and I'll be happy to kind of keep an eye on that. But I've got up on the screen here something that is very simple. This is an open high-low close candlestick chart for uh, British pound, cash British pounds versus the U.S. dollar with a very simple two moving averages and a support resistance line. And I'm gonna just offer you some observation and insights here based on who's playing this game. Now, if 85% of people are losing at any one point in time, what does that mean? That means when they liquidate, they take a loss. So the only way that can happen is if they're on the wrong side of the market. So that means for a market to rise in price, it means someone must have been willing to sell it and get hurt. So why does the market rally? It rallies because people are willing to sell it and get hurt. Why does the market fall? Because people are willing to buy it and get hurt. Part of the reason why most people don't make the money they could make in the markets is because they won't follow the very basic understanding that I can't get paid unless somebody else loses. That's really how the game is played. So if the market is falling in price, I'm looking for a place to buy it. Because when all of these 
traders can't take the pain anymore and quit, that's going to be the bottom. Now, how do we know the market is bottomed at any particular price or topped at any particular price? The simple answer to that is there's no trade down here. There's no trade up here. The market can't print a price unless an order matches another order. So if that doesn't happen, nobody's willing to play. So why is the market topped here? Because no one was willing to play up here. Who's not willing to play? The buyer is not willing to play. Why is that? Because the buyer doesn't want a high price. He wants a low price. The seller isn't willing to play either. Why is that? Because he was selling from here all the way higher. He can't find the top. So he finally quit and said, I can't take it anymore. I quit. So his liquidating buy order, which has been driving price higher, isn't there anymore. So why does the market top? Because the seller quit trading and the buyer decides it's time to sell and liquidate using a sell order. He's out too. So what is a top? A top is when nobody wants to play anymore. A bottom, nobody wants to play anymore. The constant ebb and flow between any two price points and what's going on in between, no matter how you want to measure it, you got the guys that draw their lines like this and the guys that do the Fibonacci like this and the guy that says, oh, no, this is not what's happening. This is what's happening over here. All that BS boils down to somebody wanting to put an order into the market. When they quit because they can't figure it out anymore, that's the turn. So what would tell you that nobody wants to play? Anybody got a guess? What does it mean? So I don't want to play anymore. What does that mean? What would be a clue that nobody wants to play anymore? Anybody want to offer an insight? Love to hear. Okay, I guess nobody's typing yet. That's no worries. 21506 says low volume. Bingo. So low volume on a rally means what? We're getting close to a top time to sell low volume on a sell-off could mean bottoming time to buy now how do we know if a low print or a high print really is important to the market when i say important it means it matters to both sides the only way we're going to know that is based on how much time it spends there the more time the market spends at a particular price the less important that price is the less time a market spends at a particular price, the more important it is to both sides. Here's what I mean by that. Look at how much time this market has spent at 105.40 area. Look at this, look at all this time, it's a whole day. This is an hourly chart, it's been a whole day here. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? Everybody's comfortable here, right? This price doesn't matter. I'm happy sitting on it. I'm happy just sitting here. I don't feel any reason to get out. I can get in anytime I want. This is a comfortable price. Same price area next week. Uh, underneath there, that's a problem. Nobody wanted to play underneath there. And then today, the market tried to approach that price area and spent no time at all. Look at this big, giant bidwick right here. Market is comfortable at this price level. Something starts to change. All of a sudden, both the buyer and the seller say, I better get the hell out or I got to get the hell in because we're not going to see the 105.50 area ever again. So all the buyers stepped up to put their longs on and all the shorts came in with their buy orders to cover their shorts. The market spent no time down here because everybody agrees this is an important number. It means either I got to get in or I got to get out, but it's important. I got to do something. Boom. So the market spends no time down here. Now, if you look at that bar, you will see that that's a high volume bar. If you look on futures, futures are good facility for um, volume. You'll see that that was a high volume bar, right? So what I'm telling you is, is that where most people go wrong in this industry is they try to analyze price and they try to project price or predict price. The better course of action is to look at how markets are structured to begin with 
and then look for changes in how both sides have to participate. That will always be at some number anyway. The number doesn't matter. What matters is the something going on behind the number. Do you follow me? If you look at price, it's like an apple tree. If you look at how a tree grows, you have a tree growing, it starts the growing season in the spring, how much rain it gets, how deep the roots are, how much sun, you know, how the pollination factor works, all that comes together. And at the end of 90 days, 120 days, you get apples on the tree. So the apple is the fruit of a process going on inside the tree. It's not the tree. It's not the wind or the rain or the sunshine. It's a combination of all those things affecting the process inside the tree to produce the fruit. Price is the fruit in the market. Price is a combination of volume, open interest, time, uh, all of those things together create orders and how orders come into the market. Every person who wants to play the game has to place an order. Sometimes it takes them days or weeks to decide when to place that order. Sometimes it takes them 20 minutes. Sometimes the market has to move a certain amount of distance before they're confident to place an order. All of those things combined are like the growing season on the apple tree. All that combines produces a fruit. Now, if you're somebody who knows a lot about apple trees, I can show you an apple and you can say, ah, this tree didn't get enough water in the spring. This tree grew in the shade. I can tell that because this is what's known about the apple when that happens. Well, that's what a trader does. A trader looks at the price and says, ah, based on what I see here over the past day or two or month or two or what I saw in the news based on where the tails in the market are and all this other stuff that they think that is important, I can see that this price means the seller is overconfident. The buyer is in charge. You see what I'm saying? You're going to get volatility in this market because the market is nervous. If you know anybody who is someone who's a doctor, let's say, who's a brain surgeon, he can do a CAT scan and get a picture of what your head looks like on the inside. And he can do that and tell what's going on in your thinking anytime he wants. You give three separate brain scans to a neurologist, a trained observer of what goes on in the person's head. And he can say things like this. This is the brain scan of somebody who's schizophrenic. This is a brain scan of somebody who has Alzheimer's. This is a brain scan of a normal person without ever having met those people. A trained trader who understands how price, volume, open interest, and time all work together can look at a price in the market and tell you that's a nervous market, that's a confident market, that's a trending market, that's a market that's in a corrective phase before resuming trend, that market is confused, that market has found support or resistance, any a number of things, all of which is based on what? 85% of the time, the guy who's going to really drive prices is losing. So how do you make money in the market? You don't analyze the market to find a trade for yourself. You study how the market is structured based on the loser who thinks he can predict what's happening. Now, this right here you see in the screen, this is a one-hour chart. The winning trader operates on a one-hour or higher time frame as part of his analysis process, because he knows it takes time for the majority of people to process the fact that they're on the wrong side and push the market the distance that makes it worth the risk. Now, let's look at a five-minute time frame. Now, on a five-minute time frame, 
this is where the typical losing trader is, or oftentimes even less. Let's go on a three minute time frame. So here's what a, a losing trader is looking at this data right here. And let me show you what, this, what I mean by this. This, to this person, guy on a three minute time frame, all of this data is his opportunity, right? This is highs and lows and where I should be buying and moving average crossover. And wait a minute, let's not forget, we got to put up what? Our studies, which we could just pick a few and put up our overbought and oversold oscillators and all that kind of stuff. But I want to show you something, like help you understand why the losing trader doesn't really have the ability to make money at this consistently. This is his world right here, okay? Now we're going to go to the 60 minute chart and take a look at how much data this person's really looking at, right? On a two hour time frame, can you see where this guy thinks support and resistance is? Is where? It's inside the random noise of other activity that show quite clearly where order flow changed, where people changed their mind. This is where people changed their mind. This is where they said, I have no more opportunity or I've got to find opportunity. These are the important price areas. None of those price areas are on this guy's radar. Where he's trading is inside over here. How, how can he possibly be in a position to know where the order flow is if he's not even looking at the right spot as to where it's already demonstrated its change? You see what I'm getting at? Here's a three hour time frame, and you can see even more clearly that this market is about run out of sellers. It's about ready to make a really big move to the upside. On a 240 time frame, where's that really big move starting from? Well, it's starting from about 105, and where did it end up at last time? 110 and change, right? So there's, there's a solid five handle potential over the next three or four weeks that this market isn't even communicating. The, the guy on the three minute time frame, he's not even seeing that. He's trying to find a way to get long after the market is proven its ability to move higher or get short after the market's proven its ability to move lower. The loser's waiting for things like confirmation. They're waiting for things that make them feel good emotionally, like the news, right? In my opinion, the, the best way to lose money in this business is to ignore the larger time frames. You know, here's what I want to encourage you to try doing sometime is ask yourself what, what, it, what it sounds like. I mean, if you, if you were to sit down and listen to a symphony, and you're just listening to it as it goes along and you hear the music you know as one big musical thought if i then told the conductor to eliminate just get rid of all of the strings so there's no violins no bass no nothing and all you're going to hear is the horns and the bassoons and maybe the timpanis when they come in if you didn't hear any of the violins or string instruments of any kind, you're going to hear something completely different than what the composer wrote or intended you to hear. Now, if you didn't know the difference, you may not even recognize that piece of music. If you didn't know that we'd done an experiment and removed all of the string instruments from performing this piece of art, what would, you would not hear the whole story behind that music. That's what people do when they don't pay attention to multiple time frames. Because they don't look at the high time frames and see what the high time frames are looking at, right? Then what, what they don't do is they don't hear what information is supposed to be in front of them that tells them about the entire health of the market. They focus on one little thing. You know, if you listen to just the baseline of any contemporary piece of music, I bet nine out of 10 times you could never tell what that piece of music was 
by just listening to one line of it. Well, why do you think you're losing nine out of 10 times? You're not, you're not seeing the entire process behind the entire market. You see what I'm saying? I think it's important to remember that if you, if you want to win and you're looking at how to really press the advantage that you could develop, one of the things you need to do is understand that the entire market participant is on all of these different time frames. The winner is on the higher time frames. The loser is on the lower time frames. Just knowing that alone is going to give you the ability to understand why you need to monitor both ends of the spectrum. Because when a market is in uptrend, as Euro clearly is, the potential for uptrend to continue is significantly higher. When it moves sideways after, after making a, a move to the upside, then it moves sideways. What it's doing is the order flow is basically balancing for a period of time. Trend ends in range, which then gives way to trend again. And I'll show you that real quick here on the Japanese yen. Here's Japanese yen. I'm going to go ahead and this is on a 240 time frame. Here's downtrend in dollar yen. Then we have range as the market moves between two consistent areas. This is where the order flow is balancing. This is order flow imbalance. Trend down means that there's more order flow on the sell side than the buy side. When that changes and the order flow balances, you get range. And I talk about this, the, the, the four states of the market and why trend, range, topping and bottoming work the way they do. It's because there's a natural state in the market. I talk about this in Time Compression Trading, one of my books I wrote. Um, one of the, the things that's important to understand is that the natural state of the market is loser liquidation, which is order flow imbalance. So order flow imbalance is the natural state. When the market goes into consolidation like this, this is called order flow balance. When that happens, that's temporary. So that means once you see the market go sideways, you know it's going to make a move in one direction or the other in a big way. Well, downtrend ends in range, typically followed by uptrend. So there's your uptrend in the end. And now we've got the market moving into range and possibly developing downtrend again. The downtrend is starting from a significantly lower price point than previous. So if we were to look on a bigger time frame like the daily, and let's just take everything off so we can understand it a little better here. You can see the market's in downtrend. There's your short-term range. Uptrend was consolidating. Or uptrend was a minor uptrend before resuming downtrend, right? This is a daily time frame. All right, so moving back to our illustration in Euro, the only thing I want you to understand about this particular market, the Euro, is that the potential for the market to make a strong move higher is much, much greater now than it was before. The reason being is because everybody's trying to sell it because they think the dollar's going to rally. So everybody's trying to sell Euro and they just keep getting their clock cleaned. They're, 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 the group of people willing to do that is the largest it's been in a long time. That means uptrend has a good potential of resuming and going for quite some distance before those people finally quit and say, I got to do, I'll trade cattle or I'll go back to stocks or indices or something because that's just easier. And that is exactly what happens, as you know, because you see it every day. You talk to the people you trade with and you talk to the markets, uh, the brokers and the, and the markets uh, uh, that your buddies trade. And you, you, you're in the chat rooms, right? And, and you're looking for all this information to try to process it. And you hear it all the time. You know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I, can't, I couldn't handle a cattle market. There's something going on there, blah, blah, blah. Well, and anyway, the point I'm getting at is that 99% of this business is psychology and how people think is what I'm really trying to help you understand. What I wanted to do with looking at some of the 
uh, price charts and giving you some insight on higher time frames versus lower time frames. What I want to do is just kind of open your mind to the awareness that the business is comprised mostly of losing traders. And that's just a fact. You can't win unless you figure out who the loser is and take his money from him. And if you can't do that, then you'll end up becoming the loser. And that's just not my opinion. That's just the facts. So I can open the floor up to a Q&A right now, and I'd love to do that. Um, would you guys like to take a few minutes on something? I'll be happy to spend some time on it. Let's see if I miss anything in here. Uh, let me scroll up a little bit. Uh, okay, good. All right, now uh, to listeners that have heard me speak before, um, I just wanted to say thanks for coming again. I wanted to encourage you to remember that my new product offering is out there and that's at netwinningtrader.com. You're welcome to have a look. Um, netwinningtrader.com. Uh, it's a brand new site and I hired a guy to build it and help me create the product and all the rest. And I honestly, you're gonna have to tell me if it resonates with you or not. I'd love your feedback. Love to hear what you have to say. Uh, also, if you're listening today, we've got a discount. All you have to do is type in where it says discount code. Just type in the word timing and we'll give you a nice discount if you're interested. But what kind of comments or questions do you guys have that uh, we can take a few minutes on? And whenever nobody types in anything, I get nervous. Dave has been kind enough to invite me back many times but you know what i say tends to polarize a lot of people because first of all nobody wants to believe that this business is really about beating up other people and taking their money but that's really what it is and everybody likes the idea that you can analyze and study your way to a fortune but you know what marty zweig who made more money than god in this business said i've never met a rich technician most winning traders will tell you they don't use any technical analysis of any kind. I don't. In my screen, this is what it looks like. Open high, low, close, and support and resistance areas based on where other traders quit. I have the moving averages there because averages tend to tell you where professionals are active. And professionals are not necessarily moving the market. They're participating in the market. They're not moving it. Um, but that being said, you know, we can take a few more minutes if you like. Uh, let's move this to here. Anybody else got comments or questions? No, nobody. Okay. David, I don't know what to tell you, man. <laughs> Did you see the one about how do you determine turning points? No, I didn't see that. Did I miss one? Yeah, it's right above where you where you posted the, uh, the net winning link. This is from 21506. How do you determine the turning points? Okay. All right. Um, first of all, it's really important to qualify my answer by telling you there is no way to know with absolute certainty. Part of the reason why losing traders are losing consistently is because they've got a confusion in their mind about the relationship between their participation and how the money's made. You don't need to know what the market's going to do next to make money in there. You don't. You don't need a sense of certainty. Most people feel that they have to know what the market's going to do before they can participate. You don't. If you're on the right side of the order flow, you win. Do you really care? As long as you're on the right side of the order flow. The problem is nobody can tell you what the order flow is going to be until it absolutely positively develops on its own as time goes by from the people who are actually trading. Nobody can anticipate that. How can you know what someone's gonna do until they actually do it? What you can do is get clues to what people have already done 
and understand the relationship between what they've already done and what that means to their account when they lose. Okay. In other words, you need a sense of probabilities, not certainties. And what I teach in all the training I do is to eliminate the need for, pro for certainty. You don't need to have a sense of certainty. What you need is a sense of probability. There are times when the probabilities approach 100% in the market. You would never know that if you were just simply thinking about what the price is and how do I combine and divide it with other prices in order to predict where the market's going to go in price so I can feel certain that I can play. If you don't know what the probabilities are, then you're probably not going to make money. You're going to be in the wrong spot more often. So what are the probabilities of making money at any one particular price? It's always 50-50. If you buy or sell at any one particular price, you could be wrong about the order flow from that moment moving forward, or you could be right about the order flow from that movement forward. Nobody knows what the order flow is going to be. What you're looking for is something that says the order flow is about ready to change. When it changes, that's the turning point. How good are you at understanding why someone would change their mind? Because when they change their mind, they're going to enter an order. So that's how you pick the bottoms or the tops. Where is the market now relative to where someone who is losing can't take the pain anymore? And what will cause them to change their mind? If you can answer those three questions, you can find a top or a bottom. That doesn't mean it'll top or bottom exactly where you think it will, but it eventually will. So if we look right here on our 240 euro chart, right here is our bottom, right? How do we know that? Because there's no trade down here. So on 220, 227, when the market made this low print and bounced, we know something changed right here. So let's just draw a little line across there. That's our bottom, somewhere right around here. Now the market comes down to test that price level. And what do we notice? It goes just a hair below there. It comes right back up into there. And look at this big sell wick on this bar right here at one o'clock in the afternoon, about two weeks later. Uh, does anybody know what happened on 0308? Was that Fed time? Was that when the Fed announced what? That they had uh, some sort of a change going to happen in the interest rates, right? Uh, I think that was a Wednesday. Let me look at my thing here real quick. Look back at my calendar. Uh, that was, uh, yeah, Wednesday the 8th. That was Fed time, right? So what does this big sell wick mean? This was really important to the market. The buyer said, I got to get the hell out. So he entered a sell order. And the seller jumped on those prices and said, we're going to head down to somewhere deep underneath here. This is a sure thing. And the market stayed right there for the next two bars, which is what? All the way into overnight into Tokyo, into London trading, and in the morning on the next day in New York, the market was actually pressing towards the highs from the overnight session. That can only mean the buy orders were larger than the sell orders. That's what, it, there's, not, no, uh, there's nothing else to discuss. It's not a Fibonacci thing. It's not some ABC correction way with the correlation to sugar. None of that BS. The only reason the market was higher was because the buy orders were larger than the sell orders. That's it. Well, why did that happen after the Fed said we're going to be really aggressive in raising rates? Shouldn't euro be lower? Well, what happened? All the sellers are got trapped. And what's this big rally here? This is all the sellers saying, I can't believe this market's higher. I love selling it at 105.80. 
I'm I'm in love with it now at 10650. I gotta be a seller there, that's for sure. The higher and higher and higher it goes. Finally, right here. I can't figure out where the top is. I just can't stand it anymore. I'm not gonna sell another dime. Two hours later, market makes a move and it covers the entire move to the downside in one bar. And what happens when it gets to that 105 area, 105, 30, 40 area again? What happened? Big bid wick. Never saw that area again. So here's the big selling wick right here, right into the bottom. And here's the big bid wick right back up into the bottom. And what do we know at this point? Both sides think that the 105, 30 to 40 area is really important. Well, both sides can't be right. Now we have the market pressing up towards the highs. It had every reason to do a big sell-off today and another big buying wick. So when to answer your question, do you see that bottoming isn't just one price area in the market turns? It's a, it's a, a process of thinking that has to change. And then it's price action needs to show you that that change in thinking is actually occurring. The wicks indicate the price area was really important. A sell wick means the sellers took a stand right here, got their ass kicked. Market plummeted down to, as all these buyers quit right down to the previous low. The buyers took a stand again. That was also these shorts that made this money so fast that they, they had to get out right away. Windfall. So that order flow bias created a potential bottom. Will that bottom hold? I, I think so. I, I think we're headed back to new highs somewhere well, well above here by the middle of the year. It's going to take time to get back above that area. But the market is, I think the market has pretty much communicated to us that uh, it doesn't matter how high the Fed raises rates. The dollar is being sold. So I'm not going to argue with that. All I want to do is get paid this week. See what I'm saying? So the important issue again is we're not looking for certainty. We're looking for probability. And this is the kind of thing that helps you understand probabilities. The market came to some low print and then rallied and never traded down here. Okay, that means this could be an important price point that's going to be challenged and somehow will hold or not hold. What's the probability that it will hold? On the first try, it's about 100%. On the second or third try, more than 100%. I'm just telling you. While we've been talking, this market has put on, what, from 105.95 1, It's moved in a couple hours here. This thing has moved all the way back to the highs of the bar. I mean, it's look at that wick on there. It's telling you buyers are stepping in. The sellers are the sellers are thinking that this market's going to stay below these averages. That's what the sellers think. Anyway, um, great question though. We have a few minutes left. If you guys would like to take another minute. By the way, do you guys have my email, uh, Dennis? Uh, I mean, uh, David. Does everybody have my email address? Uh, I can I can post it in there. You want me to do, okay, okay can you do that all right yeah is that the okay. right one you yeah if, if you guys have any questions about what we've talked about in here sometimes people would like to take a little bit more time because you know we're well i only have an hour uh so sometimes people want to take more time they've got bigger questions or um they'd like to to spend a minute with me that's fine i, I am available i'm a real person here in my office in sarasota florida and uh i can tell you that um, there's no question or comment or concern that you have that I can't answer. I've been trading for, like I said, 
more than 40 years now. And um, I've seen everything, experienced everything. I was doing this before there was internet and email. You know, what you get for free on the internet, I had to pay tens of thousands of dollars for. And I probably spent, I quit counting at about 60 grand, but I probably spent about 100 G's on education, training, weekend retreats, seminars, uh, anything and everything you can think, private lessons, coaching, anything and everything you could think of in order to get better at this. And I can tell you with absolute certainty and authority that this business is not what people think it is. It is about taking the other side of a losing trader's trade. And that becomes your focus when that happens. You'll find your success rate goes way up. And if you're not thinking about doubling or tripling your money every you know six months to a year, then I don't think you're thinking big enough about what potential you really have to trade. I, I really think that reason most people are financially average at this business is not because uh, they're not smart people or intelligent. I mean, I've, I routinely meet guys that would be considered, you know, the, the brightest and the best, you know, airline pilots and doctors, attorneys, people who've got PhDs can't trade their, can't trade their uh, way out of a wet paper bag. You know, it, 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 it's not about what you think it is. It's, it's about a paradigm shift. And I want to encourage everybody listening to consider making that paradigm shift. And I can help you do that. And I would love the opportunity to help you do that. Uh, so if anything I've said resonates with you, then I want you to consider me your friend in the business. Uh, the door is open. You can email me anytime. Uh, if you want to make time to actually get together and have a chat, we can do that too. Um, David was kind enough to uh, put my website up there for my new material. You're welcome to have a look at that. And of course, if you want to just find out if what I've got really holds any water, I would honestly tell you the best $10 you'll ever spend is on my latest book, The Psychology of Trading. Getting on Kindle and download it, read it uh, right now. I, I think you'll like it. Um, if that resonates with you too, then consider me you know, a potential uh, connect for you. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Anybody else got comments or questions? Justin says, hi, hi. Uh, one here says, uh, 22600 says, how do you view the two moving averages? Um, okay, let me clarify that. We got just a couple of minutes left. Let me ask you real quick here, the guy who put that in there, how you view the two moving averages. Are you asking me, what do I use the two moving averages to tell me? about the health of the market is that what is that what you're asking me what what is it that you what is it that you think i'm looking for from the averages is what i'm trying to find out he says yes okay let me help you out a little bit here the blue line would be considered the slow moving average that's the 100 bar the fast one, the blue line, is the fast moving average. That was That's the 50 bar. Now, remember when I told you that the winning trader is usually on the higher time frames? On a one hour chart, the 100 bar moving average represents more than three days of time. So what it does is it helps eliminate random noise. So if you look at, you know, like this price here and this price here, and it's right back here within 24 hours, the average is basically gone nowhere, right? Notice how the average is kind of moving, flattening out right here as we spend more and more time, you know, moving sideways. The big spikes, big rallies, big drops, that's less important to the 100 bar. What's important is that we're moving sideways net, right? That's why I use it. What it does is it filters out random noise. The moving averages tend to be places where professionals uh, pr uh, use prices. Most of the time when the moving average is under trend, what you get is participants willing 
to play at the averages. So when we look at downtrend, when a market's in downtrend, usually prices stay below both averages, right? So downtrend stays below both averages. So as long as we're staying below the 50 and the 100 bar on the 60 minute time frame, we're in downtrend. All I'm looking to do is sell if we reach either average. Here's a perfect example right here. And here's another example. So you get a little bit of a lead. This sell right here on the 100 bar moving average was less significant because we never got a new low. So that tells me that the averages are now in the process of moving sideways. And that means range. Range is followed by uptrend. Well, downtrend, range, uptrend is most likely. So with that being said, what we're looking for now is for the prices to get above the averages and stay there. That would indicate that the buyers are coming to the table underneath the averages. Now, as long as the market stays above the averages, the market is trending, every time it touches the average, that's the only place that the professional can participate for the lowest risk. In order for a moving average to be uptrending, all the prices have to be moving higher. So if it comes down to the average and goes through the average and starts to spend some time down there, then the average has to take that into account and lower prices are being averaged into the higher prices so now the average tends to, to peak and start to move lower. So if the price crosses the average, it indicates something might be changing. If it touches the average and resumes uptrend, that's where the pro is. I think you'll be surprised if you go back and look on the higher time frames, not the little ones, but the higher time frames. I think you'll see how many times the market reaches one or two of the averages leaves a wick and resumes trend. I think you'll be surprised how many times you see that. Justin says, thanks, you're welcome. I think this, who are we talking just? Okay, 22600, I hope that's, um, okay. Okay, our next guy's here. Hey, um, for you, for those of you that uh, went ahead and put comments or questions in, thank you. Appreciate that. I uh, want you to know my door is always open. Consider me your friend in the business. Uh, I'd love it if you would to take a look at some of my material. And if you got questions before you participate, you're welcome to ask them anytime.